Cheers. All right. Oh, okay. Just get my notes on guys. Okay, that's all. Awesome. Figure a world in which sport is commercialized in one is, is one wherein its most pernicious and most harmful things are celebrated, put on pedestals, and revered by the public. It results in a lot of negative impacts on both athletes and broader society. And that's the kind of things that we'll be going into today. Those two points will be my main, and I will cover some subpoints in each one. Let's start with why this is necessarily bad for athletes. The first reason why this is bad for athletes in order to commercial uh, when we commercialize. Uh, sport is it becomes extremely coercive. That is to say that there is a huge deification of things like clubs and sports that are pushed by a lot of the people who would like to make money out of these things. This looks like the English Premier League having heaps of young sporting clubs where they have draft they draft people who are like 18, 19 years old, often to play for like one game or sit on the benches and then simply kick them off the next game. Only a few people actually ever make it through and become successful as a result. A lot of other people simply get coerced into it um, through that mechanism. This looks like cricket in India, Pakistan, and even Australia. This looks like footy in Australia, right? Like the four different types that we have, right? So the mechanism here is that the clubs are pushed not necessarily for the enjoyment and love of the sport, which is what we prefer them to be pushed by. They are instead pushed by the idea of creating money and exploiting the players who they instill a love of the sport in. What this then results in is to be impact as a result of this coercion. This manifests its itself across many different aspects. Firstly is the idea of overwork, right? There is big pressure to get lots of really good games in and to have athletes performing at their top uh, uh, level uh, consistently. And so therefore, therefore you have to have like huge focus on the sport, have to train extremely hard, extremely often. They look at the NBA and like gridiron in the US as an example of this. There is often a lot of injury and early retirement as a result. And it is extremely harmful because usually this is an all or nothing gamble in that the sport is something that you choose to go into at a very early stage and don't really have any education or other skills to back yourself up at the point at which you do end up getting that injury um, uh, or retiring quite early, which is very, very common in these instances. The second impact is the one that I just touched upon in that point, being the fact that you don't really have any sort of alternative at the point at which you're coerced into that sport. Note here, this looks like people from like literal age five, just being like, I want to grow up and be like that person. And I want to play this sport professionally. At that point, they've decided that they are not going to go through with a rigorous education and invest in their future in many different ways and have many different skills to fall back on should they uh, should they fail. They are dedicated day in, day out to the sport and there is an extremely slim chance that they actually succeed. So it results in a lot of harms as a result of the commercialization that comes, as, comes about as a result of coercion. Also, we think that this is particularly bad for like female athletes. How intersectional is this case? Amazing. We think that there's like just there's heaps of male machoism in sport, right? At the point at which it's commercialized. We'll go more into this as to why it's bad for broader society and how that works. But to preface here, basically what this results in is that like people just simply prefer to see female sporting people on the TV, sorry, male sporting people on the TV. And that results in people not actually valuing female sports and they get locked out. I think on our side, the comparative, right, is that like sports is a lot more like preference based. So there's much more likely that governments will fund things based on preference in the same way that they fund more women in STEM, they'll probably want to find more women in sport. We get a lot more equal playing fields, uh, so to speak. I hope you liked that pun. So why this is then bad for broader society? We've got four reasons here. Firstly, people are coerced into buying products as a result of this commercialization. What this looks like, it, it, this looks like is like huge amounts of sponsors at sporting games. And like there's a unique advertising mechanism that occurs when sport is commercialized and that people are instilled a love for the sport through this same advertisement. But that advertisement does not come out about as a result of wanting to actually instill love. It wants, it, it wants to exploit people and coerce them into actually buying these products, right? Like when James Harden gets up there and asks you to buy XYZ, you're just like, oh my God, yes. You don't necessarily need the product. You don't actually take into account its value. You just associate it with a name and then you therefore buy it. A lot of these products aren't really that useful. And the negative team might be thinking, well, what kind of products are you talking about here? We're looking at things like alcohol and gambling being pushed, like literal actual sins being pushed by the uh, by these sporting heroes, things that they probably don't even want to sell in the first place, right? The impact here is that there's a normalization of gambling and drinking culture as a result of the commercialization of sport because those sponsors have a big foothold in sporting, right? This is extremely harmful for many reasons. Firstly, physical reasons. Obviously, it's probably bad to smoke and drink a lot, right? There's also an economic drain because gambling is in itself extremely coercive. A lot of people who enjoy sporting love to have a slap, love to place a bet, and that often results in a lot of economic turmoil. That often also results in domestic violence. It is no secret that alcohol consumption and sporting uh, and, you know, sport 
consumption often rise and like domestic violence rises with it during major sporting competitions. You're more likely to also have uh, domestic violence occurring when there's economic turmoil as a result of gambling. So that it's twofold there, right? So lots of time, lots of, and also lots of these products are like targeted at men in a very machoistic way, which just enforces that negative stereotype. And it's also much more likely to result in that negative domestic violence. We think on the outside that all goes away because you don't necessarily have that commercialization. The comparative is much more safe and better. Right. Secondly, the big impact as, as to why this is bad, deification of problematic athletes. A lot of big players are like looked up to and put on a pedestal in sporting society. Note here, these are like huge cultural heroes equivalent to like massive movie celebrities or like the politicians that literally lead the country. They are held in very high regard or at least extremely well known and they're massive cultural trendsetters. So they're bad for these people in the, at the point in which they do things like disgusting off-field behavior, which a lot of these players are really, really privy to. Like the amount of times uh, sports players have actually been called out and like been excused for absolutely abhorrent behavior. Like, you know, just going out and having a punch up or like literally abusing their partners is uh, uncountable. Like it's just, it, it's through the roof. It's especially bad for younger players who are often like very impressionable and look up to these sporting heroes and often want to emulate that behavior and take upon their values and norms. So we think it's bad in that sense. Thirdly, we think it's bad because it allows a lot of corporate exploitation. Now, I know this is like the typical capitalist bad argument, but let me explain exactly why this is so pernicious on the negative side, right? Firstly, the massive impact here is that sport is utilized in order to, uh, in a very influential nature, and corporations are able to basically paint themselves with that good sporting um, uh, sort of like uh, aura, and essentially gives it gives them like a license to like exploit heaps of people, it gives them a license to cut wages at the point at which they're seen as like a big sporting corporation that provides lots of sporting gear to like you know small teams. They can exploit workers like with MNCs like Nike and Adidas. This is just magnified to the infinitum, right? Like this. In, like international waste that they dump into the countries in which they um, operate. They like engage in literal slave labor to create sneakers, right? Like that's a, that's a huge example of like sporting companies, but also companies that aren't even directly related to sport like Marlboro who sell cigarettes literally have Indonesian children addicted to their products at the point in which they have players sporting their logo on their jerseys when they play in those uh, in those fields, in those countries. It's absolutely horrific, right? The, the, the harms are just monumental here. The second big harm is that this creates a lot of environmental harms because merch is extremely wasteful there's huge turnover right like with the nba draft if your favorite player moves from one team to the other you're buying jerseys left right center you're buying a new jersey every single year for your favorite soccer player especially when they change numbers right there's like special edition things like you know signed basketballs and stuff like that that people just buy ad infinitum they don't need all those things they simply buy them and that results in a lot of environmental harms we don't think that's good we think that we lose that on the outside which we enjoy fourthly and finally this locks out enjoyment of the sport we think the sport is a major source of joy for lots of people but a lot of these people who often want to engage it, you know, in like the favelas of Brazil playing soccer, never actually get to experience the full joy of that sport. It's simply commercialized. They never get to go through with it and get tickets to their favorite games. Only the most privileged get to do that. And therefore, all the harms that you get with the idea of locking people out of sport, with the idea of like literally enforcing uh, gambling and drinking culture and coercing athletes into a very high risk, uh, low reward lifestyle is uh, absolutely pitiful. We think that we should stand to definitely oppose that particular thing and we, sh we would stand to propose the motion. Thank you to the first affirmative speaker for that speech. I'd now like to invite the first negative speaker to deliver theirs. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay right. Three, two, one, go. Ladies and gentlemen, we say that commercialization in all its forms involves the profit motive, where money is made from sports. 
So this looks like things like advertisements, merchandise in the form of selling sports jerseys, having pay-per-view matches, stuff like that. So just to clarify, their burden is to prove that any form of profit-making in sport is morally indefensible or practical harmful or practically harmful. So in case they try to like screw this away later, we're just making this very clear from the very get-go. So two things in this speech. First of all, I'm going to deal with like their whole argumentation regarding how sports, like commercializing sports is bad for society. And then I'm going to talk about why specifically the commercialization of sport is in fact good for sportsmen, contrary to what those guys claim. Let's start. So bad for society. They say, you know, like people, like fans are being coerced into buying products. We're not quite sure how exactly the fans are coerced into buying products because they do so out of their own free will. For example, I, a LeBron James fan, would want to buy a LeBron James jersey so as to feel a closer sense of affinity with the sportsman. So we say that on the outside, by commercializing and like having the profit incentive and selling merchandise, we in fact provide a better experience, a more immersive experience in which fans get to feel like they're closer to the sportsman that they idolize. And then they talk about like how, you know, like it pushes alcohol and gambling, right? It normalizes vices. This is false because the, in the sense of advertising, we see these coming from companies like Gillette, Nike, Adidas, right? With like Colin Kaepernick and like Joseph Schooling and people like Conor McGregor. Generally, all these uh, like companies that seek advertisements are like companies that promote sportswear like Nike. So it is only in the very few rare circumstances that you have like athletes actively promoting gambling and alcohol and vices. And then they talk about like, you know, the deification of problematic athletes. We think that there's a bit of a you know, lack of explanation here, simply because at the point in which you deify an athlete, you deify him because of his excellence in his sport, of his talents, of his physical skill, not because he beats his wife, right? So we're not quite sure how exactly like, we normalize problematic, abusive behavior under our paradigm. So with that in mind, I now move on to my second main substantive, which is far more important. I'm going to talk about how exactly our policy of commercializing sports versus the status quo is good for not just athletes, but for sports as a whole. So let's see what they have said about like how it is bad for athletes. They said, you know, at a point in which we, we commercialize, it is coercive, right? But I'm not quite sure why it is coercive, because in fact, at a point in which we commercialize, we, we get like the increased ability to hire more upstarts, to hire more young talents. So it increases the accessibility to, to like all these budding new players. We're not quite sure why exactly people are being coerced into joining sports. If anything, we think that providing the opportunity for all these budding young sportsmen is far better because for the first time, they get the ability to pursue their passion, right? And then they, they said, you know, they asserted that like, at the point in which you start commercializing sport, people will not be motivated by the love for the sport itself. We are not quite sure why this occurs, right? We think that under both paradigms, people will still love sport. The question then becomes, which side is better able to facilitate access to sport and better able to make the sporting experience a better one? So this is what I would, I would prove in my subsequent argumentations. So we say that ultimately, uh, commercializing sport is beneficial for the individual sportsmen because all those things like Gillette's sponsoring advertisements, Nike sponsoring and advertisements, those form a major source of revenue for sportsmen like Joseph Schooling. So imagine those guys were talking about like, you know, sportsmen getting injured and not having a source of income in their later years. Well, guess what? At the point in which we have commercialization in which we get like, you know, massively rich commercial sponsors to give money to athletes, we think that on the outside, we have a far better retirement plan for these athletes, right? Because on the outside, Joseph Schooling does not need to worry about like swimming for like the rest of his years because he has money from corporate sponsors. We think this is good. Second thing, we say that like ultimately at the end of the day, this commercialization benefits sports in general because we gain money for sport. How is money gained from commercialization? The process of commercialization looks like people buying tickets to watch the club like Arsenal play. 
that the Indian Cricket Board and organizations being funded by TV revenue. And it must be noted that these commercial sources are their biggest sources of revenue. So what side affirmative needs to defend is a situation in which the money gained by these organizations only comes from donations. They need to defend why that amount that only comes from donations would be sufficient and why exactly people would be willing to donate. So how then would the money that is given to all these like sporting entities and organizations be used? We say two things, right? First of all, more money trickles down to the athlete. More money can be like spent on like pay, athletes pay and stuff like that. Secondly, we say that corporate sponsorship means that more money goes to the clubs and organizations and national teams that develop and train athletes and that this benefits sportsmen. Why? Because, it, because all these different teams have the incentive to improve because they want to be more competitive. So what does, uh, does this competition look like? It looks like different sporting teams competing against each other to like be better, right? It's also like different uh, sporting organizations like the UFC competing against one championship UFC so that they will be more attractive to their viewers. So what does this translate into then? Because all these teams and organizations want their athletes to be better. So ultimately, it manifests as developing better sporting infrastructure, paying athletes more to retain them and prevent like talent flight, having better trainers, having better safety standards, like medical equipment at the ringside. Like, you know, Dana White literally built a fight island with very good facilities for fighters because of the profit incentive, because of how commercialization enabled him to do so. So the comparative that those guys have to defend is clubs having less good coaches, less training, less safety standards. We're quite proud to propose on this. So what are the impacts? First of all, you have a higher barrier to entry, right? Because you have less money to train, smaller teams. So it looks like less budding, talented sportsmen being recruited. Second impact, that we say that when we have more money on the outside, we strengthen sports unions like the cricket union. Why? Because more money, right? So, and third of all, so, so sorry, more money, more members. Third of all, we increase accessibility to sport because if you're really poor and like some company like Adidas sponsors you, it means that you are for the first time able to compete on a more level footing with your more talented competitor. It also means that poorer countries get a shot at competing at a global level and being competitive in comparison to rich countries because corporate sponsors can fill in the gap where they don't have access, access to resources to currently. Second argument with regards to how it's beneficial. Prominence. How does this occur? Because there's the commercial incentive to sell more tickets, to sell more jerseys. So what does this mean? It means that sports organizations want to glorify sport. And by promoting sportsmen like LeBron James, hyping up them, hyping them up as heroes and giving them publicity and limelight. Why is this good? Three things. First, impact, because we have a better psychological impact on the sportsmen, they feel valued. Second thing, more sportsmen, because more sportsmen will, will like enter the sport, more people think that this is attractive. Last area of impact, uh, it is a source of national pride at a point in which uh, an athlete wins for the team. So at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, we have proven that all the harms to society that they talk about don't really exist. And we have proven that this is an especially beneficial thing for like the promotion of sport as a whole. Proud to propose. Thank you to the first negative speaker for that speech. I would now like to invite the second affirmative speaker to deliver their speech. The negative team in this debate might want to claim like the commercialization of sport helps to promote sort of like 
healthy behaviour um, because sport is more popular. What I think that that kind of argument misses is that it doesn't matter if sport is more popular, if it is particularly corrupt, and the fact that like sports will still exist under our side, right? They'll be government endorsed and community based, and people are always going to enjoy playing sport. Kicking around a vaguely spherical object and playing soccer is always something that people are going to enjoy and always something that people are going to do on a social level. We don't think that will ever stop um, under, uh, under our side, right? The second thing is, is that like products, are, the products prolifically advertised um, in sport are usually terrible for health. Things like gambling, tobacco and alcohol, normalizing these kinds of goods entrenches them as a part of uh, as a part of masculinity and as a part of society. Um, it's important that we, if we cared about the public and the public's health, that we didn't care about those things. We think the counterfactual in this debate is like Indonesian kids under their side are addicted to cigarettes because Malvaro sponsors soccer and makes it cool. Maybe that's not the only mechanism, but it's certainly key for how, because of how much people love sport. And I think that there's an issue of like the chicken and the egg, right? Like sport popularity existed before commercialization, not the other way around. Sports will still be popular under our side. Sports will still be something that are a big part of communities, just far less problematic than they are at the moment because of how corrupting commercialization is. Two key themes in this speech on impacts for society and impacts for sports and athletes before a new substantive point on why this is bad for the quality of sports. So first on society, um, we heard like response about that like people just have free will and we can just give them like immersive experiences because they buy a cool jersey. I think that Paul explained this clearly, but here's the mechanism again, right? When people feel emotional attachment and closeness to sport, when companies capitalize off that kind of emotional attachment, it is inherently coercive because you're taking people's emotions and like sense of community and telling them they need to buy a product to be a legitimate part of that community, right? Under our side, people don't have to do that anymore. They just, like, they just exist in communities as they actually should exist without having to spend money on products that they don't really need. We think that people can be immersive by like just attending sports and cheering for teams or like playing socially with their friends. We think that it's a lie to say that um, people need to buy a jersey to feel like they are actually a part of a team. It's a lie that corporations tell you to make money off them. That's not a positive thing. They also said that like, it's not just not true that like gambling is a big part of sports. They didn't actually disprove this. They just list like Nike. It's true that gambling is uh, like a well-known phenomenon in sport. Like gamification is a studied issue. Um, the reason why, it's the reason why we have things like rigging scandals and literally like, um, uh, literally uh, like, uh, it's one of the most major revenue makers and will be in every ad break of a sporting game. Paul used the example. Um, uh, additionally, there are other like particularly problematic products like um, alcohol and, um, uh, and cigarettes, which are also particularly bad. We think that even like the example of Nike is not a positive product that we want to be endorsing to people, right? Like they are shit for the environment and literally use sweatshops that like collapse and kill 900 women. We think that that is a terrible thing to be supporting and to be normalizing in something um, that people like really look up to uh, and, um, uh, and, and are likely to think is good because they advertise in sport, right? The last thing on like normalization of problematic behavior, again, they didn't really explain their response here. So I'll just repeat, like, like explain again what the mechanism is. Because toxic masculinity is prolific in sport, it's inherently sort of like a lot of sports, um, uh, particularly contact sports, really like glorify um, people being violent. Um, and when they are mixed, with like when that sort of messaging is mixed with products like alcohol and we hold up idols like people who commit domestic violence as idols we sort of uh, have links between sports and that toxic masculinity and those problematic products like alcohol which can fuel that sort of bad behavior we think that those are the mechanisms through which um like that sort of problematic behavior is proliferated through this commercialization and is certainly something that we should regret. Under our side, we don't have that sort of idolization of those products as an important part of, of the activity. So then on the second issue of like sports and athletes, they say that it's good for players to have money, 
particularly for like poor players. We think that the thing is here that like governments will still pay people to pay to to play sports. Maybe they won't have as high um, an income as they do under status quo. We actually don't think that is a bad thing. A couple of reasons for this. First, the money is incredibly corrupting. The people who actually get paid more are people are like coaches and people who organize leagues. That money gives them an incentive to like push players past um, what is safe and to like uh, increase the risk of injury because they might like pressure them to play even though they've like got an ankle injury or something like that. That financial incentive means there's always like corruption to the best interests of players. We also um, think that like when, uh, it, when money like when the amount of salary that you make is dictated by commercialization, it is inherently linked with how many people are watching the sport, not like the societal value of sport. I think that's the main reason why women uh, sports players get pay paid less, right? Like if we had a world where government was paying the salaries of sports players, it's far more likely that women would be, pay would be paid an equal salary to men, would be able to do things like um, actually pl play full time rather than having to like work a second job just so that they could, you know, be an internationally, uh, an international sport player. We think that um, it's a far better world for like those more intersectional sports players um, when they get paid fair salaries, even if those right at the top have their salaries reduced a bit. We also heard that it's sort of good for supporting sports and like getting better infrastructure and stuff, right? We think that we still can get a decent amount through like government and donations because quite a lot of incentive for governments to, um, uh, to build this sort of infrastructure because it's very popular among people and um, it's a lot of good thing for like national identity and creating national spirit. That's the reason why um, they also, you know, build things like nice parks and memorials and stuff. We think sports are, are also something that they're likely to invest in. But we think that because of commercialization, like because uh, it has corrupted sport, we'd still pre prefer a world where like maybe there is marginal, like where, maybe where there is uh, less good infrastructure um, um, and uh, we think that that's fine because um, uh, like it's so bad at the moment that, um, uh, that we would rather that world. So then lastly on like a new substantive point on why this is bad for the quality of sport, which is also responsive to their content. We think the first reason that this is bad for sport is because of corruption and rigging. And this is a direct result of sort of gambling in sports, right? We think of issues like the Australian cricketers ball, tam ball tampering and like boxes, like throwing games. Those are a result of commercialization where like gambling has become prolific in sports um, and it provides a financial incentive for players to rig games because they are paid out uh, to do that. That inherently makes sport much, much worse because it is literally <clears throat> no longer a fair game. It is entirely rigged and it's probably far more prolific than we know because it is hard to catch out. We think that is a bad thing for the quality of sports and is inherently linked with that sort of commercialization, especially linked with gambling. We think under our side, we get better sports, better communities. We are happy to sacrifice some of the proliferation or infrastructure if it means we have a better society. We're very proud to propose. Thank you to the second affirmative speaker for that speech. I would now like to invite the second negative speaker to deliver theirs. I would just like to point out that the principal undertones of the affirmative team's case is that the commercialization of sport would make the, the entire industry coercive in nature. You know what this means? By extension, anything that involves commercialization will be coercive. That means they support a world without Spotify, they support a world without things like access to the internet, without smartphones. They also might not want to deal with colleges as well because colleges are run by profit-motivated businesses. So actually the alternative that they are trying to defend implicitly at least that we should all live in a Marxist society because insofar as you put a price tag onto anything, that is coercive. But you know what? We think that this is not favorable on our side of the house because despite some degree of coercion, even if we accept that that exists, the kinds of profits that you earn, the kind of publicity that you get for sports would justify this mar marginal degree of coercion that would exist on both sides of the house. So with that being said, I'm going to talk about a couple of things. First of all, let's deal with the idea of athletes being harmed. First thing that they told us in first speaker is that athletes are 
going to sacrifice things like their education for sports. But why is education an A priori good when certain people are better off doing sports as opposed to pursuing a college education? Not everyone is cut out for college education. They've never proven to us why this education is necessarily an A priori good for society. If anything, right, we think that the solution to this problem where people are making irrational decisions to skip out of college education to pursue a sporting education at their own expense is to cover up this information asymmetry by having some form of governmental policies to incentivize people to go for education. But you know what? If such a policy does in fact take place and athletes still choose not to still choose not to pursue a college education, we think that if anything, we should respect this choice because maybe they are the ones who should exercise their agency and decide that pursuing a sporting career is better for them. So actually, coercion is exists greater on their side of the house because people are now being coerced to get white collar jobs and pursue an education the same pathway that everyone else has to go through as compared to coercion on our side of the house, which is coercion to make money from what you already have potential in. But furthermore, we also argue that the commercialization of sports expands the job market within a particular economy. So this eases the pressure on prospective sportsmen who can now choose to use this, um, this particular means in order to earn money for themselves. Second thing, and perhaps a more pertinent thing, right? they talked about corporate um, exploitation and how sportsmen are going to be harmed. First of all, I want to point out that sporting unions exist on both sides of the house. So that means that when you have more sportsmen on our side due to things like commercialization, where more people are incentivized to join a sports this increases the power of the unions. So if anything, this deals with the whole problem of forcing players beyond their limits, underpaying women whatsoever, because the sporting unions are, have more power and uh, more bargaining power to protect the, the sporting players on our side of the house. But second, we also argue that corporation, corporations themselves, despite being profit incentivized, they still have a minimum incentive to develop the infrastructure. Why is this the case? Two main reasons. The first reason is that there's going to be increased media scrutiny on all all sporting activities, including the way in which sportsmen are being treated. This is going to appear on mainstream media. This is also going to appear on social media because of all the fanatics that they wanted to talk about. When you have social media, that's when fans continuously keep track of their players, like day-to-day -day activities, the way in which their manager is treating them whatsoever. This serves as some degree of check and balance that, and we think that clubs will necessarily respond to this because clubs want to preserve their reputation in order to have continuous funding, sponsorships, whatsoever, and legitimacy with in the economy. But we think that this um, increased commercialization makes it even more uh, possible to hold clubs accountable because now there is more competition. So therefore their, rep uh, therefore, their reputation and their legitimacy is even more important if they want to cement their clout within the industry. But second, the second reason for why there will still be a minimum incentive is that companies will still need to remain competitive in the market. So that means they still need to invest in things like better sporting facilities. If anything, we uh, we'd argue that the athletes would have more safety equipment on our side, better coaches, as well as better soccer fields. So this allows the individual athletes to expand their, their, their potential within this industry. We think we ultimately help sportsmen to grow. The second thing they wanted to talk about is society, right? They said that, oh, sportsmen, is going to, uh, sportsmen are going to be put on a pedestal. So as a result of that, they can get away with things like assault and other kinds of criminal offenses whatsoever. I think that this applies to a situation where any kind of influential figure exists, right? So do you regret celebrities as well? Do you regret cults of personalities as well, uh, what are you going to do about politicians who happen to be corrupt as well? The thing is, they never provided us with any kind of alternative as to how we deal with these kinds of people. I suggest that their side necessarily defends a world where you get rid of all potential, potentially influential figures. If anything, the solution on our side of the house probably lies with things like government policies and such. But second of all, they talked about the normalization of vices and um, uh, including things like gambling. I think, first of all, that's just not true and it's not comparative because we told you a series of benefits as to why it's necessary and why it's important to increase the publicity via the normalization of sports. The comparative is that there's far less publicity, far less limelight that's placed on sports. So that means less people are exposed to it. So we, we, we see how this uh, normalization of vices is. It's not exactly an issue. But second of all, I think it's also a bit uncharitable of the other house to, to say that we need to defend things like illegal gambling and whatsoever. I think the burden um, on both sides of the house is, is to have a government that can impose regulationary policies. And the solution is not necessarily to regret commercialization. This is blatantly uncomparative analysis on the other side of the house. I think they should be penalized for that. The third thing they talked about is that 
oh, people feel that they need to spend money in order to feel included in the community. Three responses to this. First of all, I think that you can bond with your friends from watching soccer and cricket with your friends at home or at the local bar. So please don't buy their unrealistic characterization that every person who is interested in soccer feels co-works to go to watch a sporting match and pay hundreds of dollars in the process. Second of all, I think it's also unrealistic on their side to just assume um, to assume that all poor people, for instance, are going to spend hundreds of dollars on a sporting ticket. But even if this is the case, right, we think that A, this exists in a minority of situations. And second of all, the problem actually lies with the government's failure to educate people on financial planning as opposed to the very nature of commercializing the sport itself. They, that is their burden of proof. The third thing is that we think that um, usually the ones who end up spending money to, to, to fund the sport, uh, sporting industry and paying for sporting tickets and merchandise are usually the people who are in the middle class or the people who are rich and we think this is particularly benefic uh, beneficial in certain cases not just to benefit athletes by having corporations uh, clubs for instance uh, investing those uh, ticket revenues and sponsorship revenues in like the um on uh, improving sporting equipment and facilities. But more than that, we think that this also benefits develop, developing countries even more. So this is going to be my extension on our side. We think that um, when you have increased commercialization of sports, this means that there will be a, a proper platform and avenue uh, where sportsmen coming from less developed countries, such as say Jamaica, for instance, will not be able to make it to the Olympics and, and whatsoever. Why is this necessarily important? First of all, we see that when there is an international stage, with an international audience watching you, this um, this would create um, economic revenue that would, to some degree, at the very least, trickle down to the local economy. This is because the sporting industry in those developing countries uh, is going to grow. So that means there would be some kind of a cyclical effect where the government sees this as a comparative advantage and chooses to invest in the industry even if we assume that there is some degree of corruption whatsoever, we think that at the very least, there would be some kind of revenue that would flow down to the players, to the industry. But the second reason as to why this is important to have limelight is that the stigma of people in general from less developed countries would be erased because now you can see um, um, people like Usain Bolt who are performing so well, people who are so respectable like him. These are the people who are invited to talk shows like the James Corden show. They get sponsorships as well. This is where um, people would gain a new form of respect for these people because they see them from a different light. We think that even if this does not solve things like discrimination, it at least is a stepping stone for that. But third of all, you give these people the chance to be the pride of their country, which does not exist on their side of the house. For all those reasons, we think that our set should take this debate. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the second negative speaker for that speech. I now invite the third affirmative speaker to deliver theirs. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. There is no response to the material that we give you to say the government has an incentive to invest in this social good. Education is free for a reason, because people find a benefit from it and it benefits society. So insofar as the opposition proves a social benefit, it can be accrued under our side. The difference now is that it is not captured by corporations. Instead, it is completely controlled by perhaps by governments and people themselves. In fact, it is also controlled specifically by communities. Communities can take their kids out to kick a ball around. It is no longer called 
corporations that say in order to in, in, invest in sport and feel as if you're a part of sport, you must be buying a jersey. That is the difference between the opposition team and ours. We can have sport under our side as well, but it is higher quality. Second, two questions in this speech. Firstly, is it socially acceptable for sport to exist with commercialization? And secondly, is, what does this model do to the quality of sport? First question, is it socially acceptable for commercialization to exist for sport? Your position is like, oh, well, your model just says that commercialization in general is bad for everything. Well, no, we gave you unique reasons why it is bad in like, you know, in, in for sport specifically, but you don't prove why we, why we can't be Marxists in this debate. Like the, what is the harm that they have attached here in this in, in this in this vein. So, given that it is perhaps socially unacceptable for commercialization to exist, I'm going to run through some of the material that they give you. I'll firstly talk about the social impacts and the social access to sport and why commercialization is bad. They firstly say that no, sports don't and will not promote sins. That is, that they won't do things like like you know promote gambling. And the second speaker, so un, like uncharitably and so just like outside of the scope of the rules of this debate, is like. It is unfair that you're making us defend this. What do you think a debate is about? You like literally have that harm in the status quo. That is the pervasiveness of gambling on like in the fields. On soccer, you literally see the banner of sports bet. That means that you necessarily must accrue that harm because commercialization is that corporations can make a profit from that sport. And that was the, that was the harm that we were trying to deal with. But secondly, they do not respond to any of the incentives that we give you, even if it is true that they don't do it so badly now, why it is likely that they are they have they will have an incentive to do this or continue to do this or do this even more in the future that was to say that you could gain a profit from this you could get like you know this other pe like people across the globe to purchase your merchandise like you like the nba makes so much money by literally just having the draft system the draft system is where they like you know like shake up the players across teams and what happens is that if your favorite player moves from team one to team two you have to buy two jerseys now that means that over the course of a, of a specific player's lifetime there are looking so much money from fans you do not give reasons as to why they will not exploit these players for like you know getting Malbro to sponsor them anymore like continually to continue to sponsor them you don't give us any incentives for why they will not allow gambling uh, companies to continue to sponsor them either it is likely that they will have incentives to do that because it makes them even richer you concede that profit is important for these uh, for these corporations why do you not incur that harm the second the third thing to say here is that they don't respond to the capacity for these corporations and to do to like you know promote sins and for sports to promote sins that is that corporate sports sports and corporations capture government and they and they ask politicians and force perhaps politicians through electoral success to say that if you give up if you give us like you know like lower regulations over what we can promote then we are okay but then we'll give you like your seat in parliament and what that means is that they do have the capacity to launch this kind of to promote these types of sins and also and additionally you also have like like and so for those reasons we think that like obviously the capacity and an incentive to promote sins is high the impact is even higher that is that people are, are addicted to like you know gambling that is that people like you know like their sports star and now they try gambling and they try it the second time the third time they start to get addicted and now those people cannot consent to the continuing gambling that they're doing additionally they cannot consent to all the alcohol that they're consuming additionally domestic violence gets higher this team just fails on that social front they then say in the social sub sub issue that commercialization increases access for people to enter sport firstly you provided no mechanism for this we gave you reasons why people are locked out of sport because of commercialization. Secondly, we, th we think that people can do community sports. Why can't you just go to the park and kick a ball around? But thirdly, we think that governments have an incentive to invest in competitive and high caliber sports. Why? A, because it is a social good. Even the opposition concedes that we don't need to mechanize this any further. B, well, first negative literally also concedes that people love sports, so they will put pressure on politicians and governments to build those communities. Even what, literally, communist governments love sport as well. The, the USSR had heaps of sports investments. All right governments also care about sport. Hitler loved sport. Why is it not true that people will not invest in sport? Governments love sport. And additionally, first negative says that people have an identity and national identity. 
you. Why do sport? Why is sport not invested in? We do not need commercialization for access to occur. The second sub issue in this issue is that they say, well, accountability occurs because there's more people and there's more unions and media also has spotlight on you to keep you safe. But obviously, there's lots of people in sport because governments have like asked, like given you access to that, and people also put pressure on governments. It is likely the governments are going to have an incentive to make that safe. But secondly, I'm clear why you as a government will not want to make your competitive players like you know when you go to international sports have safe facilities to train you also want to make schools have safe facilities to train so that you could create that class of players that was super good at sport obviously there are incentive to allow injury to occur in fact there's an incentive for injury to not occur third sub issue is about the culture they're just like oh we don't have to de defend gambling i've already responded to that in my introduction they then say well do you regret politicians and celebrities and corrupt people yes we do the next thing that they say is that oh well you're not coerced into like you know joining a sports but like us like sporting leagues and stuff like that if you are like um if you are uh like like uh like you know if you you're not coerced into like like as, as a young person but obviously that doesn't respond to the fact that poor people are, are more likely to be coerced so obviously it is likely that those people experience those harms notice that paul gives you a slew of other harms i'm not going to reiterate that that is something for perhaps the reply or for your notes this team is unresponsive second issue even if it is true that like you know the quality like sports provide a social good if it is commercialized they need to prove that there's a benefit that comes from that commercialization i'm going to prove in this second issue why commercialization doesn't do anything to the quality of sport in fact it could reduce it let's go through their claims they say that investment creates revenue for leagues and players a few responses firstly it is unlikely that sponsorship will be will going will be going to everyone in sport it's only going to the highest top tier people olympians that's a very few people who are gaining that benefit so the harm and then the scale of the harm is unclear to me in this debate if one sports star like serena williams isn't getting a million dollars who cares but secondly you need to also weigh the fact that governments are likely to invest in sport anyway to give people a like you know competitive edge in, in those international leagues for first negative reasons is that they gave which is that there was national identity but thirdly who cares if people don't have money way in this debate the fact that you can get a job and be productive in other parts of the economy versus you necessarily having a coercive market you having a market that locks out women's sport you having a market that accrues all the social harms paul talks about i think he listed six unclear why this claim is important they then claim well you know the prospect of having more money means that you are more competitive well people in debating don't earn money but they are still competitive they want to get better because there are other motivations for example intrinsic motivations they then say oh well more money in sport like increases safety i've already responded to that at the conclusion of this speech it is not socially acceptable that commercialization exists they don't provide a benefit they should probably lose this debate we will take it Thank you to the third affirmative speaker for that speech. I would now like to invite the third negative speaker to deliver theirs. Give me one second. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. What is the trade-off in this debate? Because notice it's insufficient for affirmative to just say that there are harms, but, uh, but absolutely refuse to weigh those harms against the benefits that we brought to you from side negative. Right? Because we're very clear what the trade-off in this debate is. On that side of the house, absence of commercialization, what they create is a situation in which there is a less ability for people to make money as a result of going into sports as sportsmen, less money for clubs and like to develop things like infrastructure and coaching, and less opportunities therefore for like poorer individuals to actually access sports absent of this kind of funding. Because someone talked about two things in the speech. One is commercialization necessarily better for athletes, 
And two, is it better for society? I want to like weigh the trade-offs and show you why we why we still win this debate. So let's start with what their alternative was. Their alternative was the government can necessarily fund sports. Here's the problem with this. Governments often have very, very limited resources, and especially in developing countries, where there are many, many calls on the public purse, things like sports often end up being deprioritized in status quo anyway, right? Insofar as there are more important things to fund, like education, like healthcare, like the military, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Which means the amount of money that governments can allocate towards sports at the point at which sports wholly relies on government funding is very, very limited. What is the impact of this? The impact of this is that A, that, that the number, that the teams that you have and the opportunities you have are necessarily smaller, right? Because you cannot afford to pay that many sportsmen. You're probably going to have like one national team that's funded by the government as is in status quo, right? Which means that like the number of opportunities for individuals to actually enter the sporting industry is limited. At the point where it's like your first level is the only ones that have the ability to get in. But secondly, is that even if we accept the government has the incentive to pay you like higher wages and stuff like that, the government is still constrained by its limited resources and I would probably doesn't have the capability to do so even as a result of it. On our side of the house, what do we have? One is we have a greater opportunity for like uh, for players to enter the sporting industry. At the point which clubs have a profit incentive to set up, investors have a profit incentive to fund these clubs and actually make like create as many opportunities as possible to find most amount of budding talent and give them the opportunity to develop because they can then make money off them in the future, uh, which maximizes choice and maximizes opportunity on our side of the house. But secondly, so we can actually deal with things like low wages as well, because now the government as insofar as the government isn't only funding sports, the government has more money left over to do things like top up, the, like give welfare, for instance, to severely underpaid sportsmen, which can only happen on the our side of the house, because on their side of the house, all that government revenue goes towards funding sports as goes towards funding sports. So that government revenue can be reallocated in a much better manner. We also think this means that we actually benefit the female athletes better on our side of the house as well. Because if it is true that the government has an incentive to fund female athletes on their side of the house, that incentive exists on our side as well. The difference is on our side of the house, the government can actually devote more resources to female athletes because the male athletes are being funded by their sponsors and by like as a result of commercialization. So they don't need additional wages from the government. So we actually better help female athletes on our side of the house if that incentive does exist. So what are the only harms they tell us? Firstly, they tell us that people are coerced into going into sports, right? Like we don't think this is true, right? Because like one, the impact of this is minimal at best because like this applies to a very tiny minority of individuals who like are probably very talented and probably trained hard during their school time. Anyway, like most people go and get an education in state school as it is. But secondly, the impact of this coercion is minimal as well. Because the amount of time you have to spend training at the club is often proportional to the likelihood of you playing and benefiting as a result of being in that club. So for instance, if you're only in the training squad and you can't actually play a game and benefit, the amount of time you spend training is probably less, which means you have probably have time to do things like get a part-time education, or like a part-time like degree while you're at it. Whereas if you're actually playing in the first level, that is when you're like committed to full-time training, at which point you make money as a result of being in that club when you do well. And therefore the impact of this is that the impact of this kind of coercion is minimal. Secondly, is that they say that clubs push athletes and things like overworking and injury and things like this. First off, we think that's untrue because it, if you hurt your athletes and they can't compete, you cannot make money off of them, right? So there's no incentive to like push athletes to the point of injury. We think you strike a balance when it comes then on outside the house, you have more incentives and better able to ensure athlete safety. But secondly, is in terms of like athletes not getting an education, that doesn't change either because on their side of the house, athletes still enter sports at the age of 18 because that's when they're at their prime, which means if they had to compete, like compete in sports competitively on their side, they still have to trade off their education. That's, that, that doesn't change anything either. So on our side of the house, we've shown you how we actually benefit athletes better. Let's then deal with this issue of society and uh, how this how commercialization of sport hurts society. The biggest harm was that gambling and alcohol get advertised as a result of this, and this then hurts society. Firstly, most countries have banned the advertising of gambling and alcohol and other city industries anyway. We don't see why we can't do this in status quo. But secondly, that we don't think anything changes, right? because the alternative is that if these companies are so profit motivated, they're going to find other ways to advertise anyway, right? So like advertising on like public transport, for instance, or advertising um, or like 
actually spending their resources to actually going into communities and pushing cigarettes and stuff and like setting up shops in communities to push their products in these communities especially we think these are far more pernicious at the point which they like they expose uh, they at the point which these are more accessible to a greater number of individuals as opposed to the individuals who end up watching sports but fine uh watching sports i'll i'll, I'll wear this helm off later as well secondly in terms of problematic athletes we think they often were backlash against problematic athletes as a result of the popularity of sports and the fame that these athletes have but secondly is it due to this backlash that exists corporate sponsors also don't want to be associated with problematic athletes because it hurts their brand image as well so therefore they drop and stop sponsoring these athletes this is important because as athletes are dependent on their sponsors they have an incentive now to not do problematic things if they don't want to lose their corporate sponsorship on their side of the house there is no such dependency and no such incentive therefore to not do problematic things because if, you, if you're a problematic person we don't think the incentive for you to do problematic things changes as a result of sports whether whether it's through sports or not finally in terms of in terms of um how this hurts like causes people to buy jerseys and merchandise and all that here's the point with this we think there are different types of happiness in status quo and they are not mutually exclusive so people who want to get happiness by kicking a ball around in their community and their friends can still do so on our side of the house as well people who get happiness from like buying jerseys can do so on our side of the house as well what we do is we maximize choice because on their side of the house when they don't have these jerseys in the first place we think they are denying the opportunity for a certain group of people to actually gain that form of enjoyment at the point which that is the source of their happiness that's why we think they actually like meet curtail choice on their side thirdly in terms of corruption and rigging and all that look we think one these are illegal but two is a day is a deterrent against them right in so far if you if you get caught you end up getting banned for life um and which means that you put so much effort and you really have no alternatives then you probably won't risk your entire career over a single payout that's why things like corruption and rigging aren't as prominent in status quo so what is the trade off the trade off here is only harm that they have slept standing is um uh, this this gambling and alcohol thing. why is it less important than the opportunities we provide to sportsmen one gambling and alcohol can still continue to exist in surprise they can use other opportunities to do this the difference is on that side of the house there are less alternatives for individuals who cannot get into competitive sporting industry as a result of a lack of funding from the government or like as because government has limited resources and therefore we think that in the enterprise is the case our one is a more exclusive benefit that we get on our side of the house as compared to their harm that's why we're very proud to oppose Thank you to the third negative speaker for that speech. I would now like to invite the negative reply speaker to conclude the negative bench. Three, two, one, go. Side affirmative ignores the structural importance of money. They say the government will still organize sporting events. Sports will still be popular. Yes, but that misses the point because the point is that sports will be heavily harmed and compromised by the lack of money. They considered to be happy to sacrifice some infrastructure and money. but what they didn't realize was how important these things are and how this will cause them to debate so two things in the speech first which side benefits sport second about like society right so which side benefits sport or all the mechanisms that we gave you right away in first so on an individual level what does this commercialization of sport look like we already told you very clearly they involve things like you know corporate sponsors like Gillette and Nike and Adidas like giving advertisements and like having people like Joseph Schooling on those advertisements so what this means is that these people get a lot more money so it means that when those guys start talking about like how you know like athletes are coerced into like less beneficial job opportunities you know what it is outside that actually makes sports far more viable and far more lucrative for these sportsmen who have a very limited career time and very limited shelf life in the first place right because we make sports a far more viable 
a job opportunity. And on, on an organizational level, what did we tell you? We told you that the money given to organizations like 1FC will be spent on athletes anyway. Why is that the case? Because these organizations have an incentive to be competitive, right? So like ultimately, at the end of the day, these will be like scouting new budding talents. We give opportunities to new aspiring sportsmen who actually want to pursue this career path. And we're not quite sure how this is coercion, like what those guys complain about, right? So that, uh, we say that on a societal level, what this means also is that their side results in the government having limited resources because there's a higher barrier to entry because it means less money to train, meaning smaller teams. So it means less sportsmen being recruited, less sportsmen getting to pursue their dreams and passions. We think that all this is very important. Furthermore, we've already mitigated all the claims coming out from their side because we say that money strengthens sporting unions by like the cricket union. Because at the point in which you have more members, more sportsmen, these unions are far better able to protect their workers. And then they say, you know, only Serena and Williams will benefit. Untrue, we already told you that a lot of these organizations, money goes into organizations like the UFC, and that this money trickles down to a lot of the athletes because the UFC wants to be competitive, so it invests in higher pay, it invests in good facilities, all these directly benefit all the athletes under their brand. And then they say, you know, people don't value from female sports. This will happen in either paradigm. So absent of commercialization, this will still happen. I'm not quite sure how exactly their model changes anything. So down the bench, the responses to our positive argumentation were really meager. So next argument then on society. We have comprehensively engaged with and took down their arguments on society. So here's a summary, right? First thing, opportunity cost. Kavindra told you that there's a very real trade-off under their model because they said that under their side, the government steps into the role of the sponsor. So this means that what their government is doing is channeling away precious limited money from other causes like social welfare, you know, medicine. So your side actively hurts society as well. Uh, yeah, don't think that we haven't noticed that. Then they talk about like idolization. This literally happens for anyone who is popular. Their side solves nothing. And then they talk about like how it forces people to buy stuff so as to feel like they're part of the community. But we say that inclusiveness can be like generated in many manners. People can bond and feel like, you know, a sort of empathy for their sports idols by watching cricket at a local bar. Like what Ariel told you, we're not quite sure why exactly there is a need to buy stuff for you to feel included, right? Lastly, they talk about like, you know, gambling and sports betting. Kevindra told you very clearly that this is banned anyway, even in a world where sports is commercialized. So they cannot cherry pick examples and use the examples as the argument. Last point, search shops and exploitation of labor. This is uncomparative because even if we buy the commercialization of sport causes child labor, which we do not, search shops will still exist under their world. So their model really solves nothing. So let us be very clear, ladies and gentlemen. Those guys uh, like, tried to stake their claim on like, this whole uh, like, uh, societal benefit argument. We have took it down anyway. And we've proven to you why outside benefit sports. Because of that, oppose. Uh, thank you to the negative reply speaker. A reminder that replies should be four minutes in length. I now invite the affirmative reply speaker. Okay. The important thing to remember in this debate was that sports have been popular and prolific before commercialization. Advertising only really became prolific in the mid 20th century. The harms of commercialization the affirmative team brought down the bench were egregious. We corrupted communities by telling them they needed to spend money to participate in the activity and excluded people who could not afford that. We facilitated mass corruption and rigging and there was when, when there was so much capital on the line and we normalized unhealthy products traditionally linked with particularly masculine sports like tobacco, gambling and alcohol. There are two key things that I think uh, were discussed in this debate. First on society, which was the clear affirmative win, and then on the impacts of sport. So first on society. I don't think that the negative team actually brought any societal benefits on their side, only mitigation of our harms. Those harms, but there was a culture of violence and domestic, uh, particularly domestic violence and the deification of those people who committed those kinds of crimes by giving them a lot of money and including them in advertising 
Um, and like they, there was an incentive for them to remain that kind of hero status because the uh, organization relied on those kinds of characteristics to be able to sell their products. Addiction was leading to personal and financial devastation. The connection of those products with the emotional and community attachment that came with sport meant that they were incredibly effective at proliferating within those communities and corporate waste and multinational um, enslavement was a huge harm that was also uh, copped by the negative team when they allowed companies like Nike to continue advertising and become prolific within society. People became apologetic to this kind of behavior because they looked up to these players who advertised these products on behalf of companies as idols and attached those kinds of products with the love and the meaning they felt for sport. Maybe they said they got some sort of national identity, but clearly the world was better when your national identity was not linked with booze or literally any other kind of product. We think there was a complete lack of actual response on this point, and it clearly won us the debate. But we also got better outcomes for sport, which is where they rested most of their case. First on the issue of funding, they say that like there's no incentive for, uh, for sports to be funded because of education and healthcare being more important. I think Jerry and I both clearly explained why those incentives are in place. It's the same incentive that they talk about, which is national identity, right? And pressure on governments from people. The government acts based on what people want. People like sports, as we have proven, as we all agree, they will be incentivized to fund it. Even if we had marginally worse facilities under our side, because sport already existed without commercialization and was incredibly popular, it was not necessary for us to prove um, that it would still exist under our side. We know that it would. Additionally, they talked about sports pay. This negative point is only about top tier earners, not about like all um, sports players in the status quo. Uh, Olympians other than top tier performers aren't paid anyway. It's the same mechanism as above for why governments are likely to pay these players. Most pay in the status quo goes to managers and that was why there was pressure on players um, to risk injury because their managers had an incentive to push them in that direction. It's important to also remember that in the status quo with commercialization, female sports players don't get paid. They couldn't claim that they were going to because the government somehow had more money to do that. Also on the issue of corruption, all they said here was that social media and reputation was a mechanism to stop it. This did not explain why we see things like Australian cricketers tampering scandals or boxers rigging games. This ruined sport and was entirely in opposition to their only benefit of improving games. It didn't matter if you had a fancy stadium, a million dollar salaries, if the game was fake. Money was not the mechanism for improving sport. It was the mechanism for corrupting it. Sport is important and it is important to preserve its integrity. This was a clear affirmative win. Thank you to the affirmative reply speech. Uh, I invite both 